and then 200 is uh, a little bit uh, later. In, in Got it. Wow. So GM 204s. GM 204. Yeah. Cool. And that's the ones I'm looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> but hardware is actually only part of, of what NVIDIA does. Um, and a lot of you guys probably know that best from us. We actually have more software engineers at NVIDIA than we do hardware. Mm. And uh, we use that to produce uh, amazing technologies to improve video games for game designers, to improve professional graphics applications, and to create software that runs on a, a consumer's uh, system to help them have a better experience in graphics. Uh, this is a, a demo for a technology that we call DXGI. Um, and so I'm gonna set up the problem here, and this is, we can look at this and instantly know that it's computer graphics because the lighting is just all kinds of bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, uses uh, direct lighting, which is pretty common in, in PCs. Uh, recently, we've seen more and more technologies that have evolved to compute how to create ambient lighting so that the, the shadows aren't quite as, as ugly or nasty. Uh, but of course, the best way to do lighting would be with something like computed global illumination. Uh, and of course, we have a, a great solution for that. This is... Uh, computed global illumination running at a 4K resolution. Um, so it's computer graphics, and it runs on five of those boxes over there with eight of our GK 110s. Wow. So um, quite a bit of GPU horsepower. Um, and it still takes about 25 seconds for me to render a single frame. So obviously not quite quick enough for the uh, video gamer who wants you know a 40th of a second or faster frame delivery. So we had to create some interesting technologies and techniques to simulate global illumination. So the first thing we had to do is convert these graphics from these 2D meshes of geometry, which we've applied textures to, into something that actually has three-dimensional information stored in it. So we, we convert the whole scene into voxels, or volumetric pixels. Um, and based on how far they are from the, the object is from the camera, determines the resolution, so how many vo uh, voxels we, we generate. Uh, we then cast uh, cones through the entire scene and we compute based on what uh, voxels those cones interact with how to create an indirect lighting. We then uh, combine the, the indirect lighting that we've computed now with the direct lighting. So that original image, oops, click all the wrong buttons there. Uh, and that leaves us with, with this image here, uh, which looks a, a lot better than where we started. Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, remarkable improvement. Um, and the advantage of this technique is that it's completely uh, interactive in real time. So I can change wow. uh, things like the lighting, see all the shadows um, wow. obey wow. Uh, and follow wow. exactly the, uh, the way we want them to. So if I'm a gamer, I can come in and I can blow up the place and, and the lighting will, will look like a jagged wall and, and you know my rocket marks and all, all, that, all that fun stuff that I want as a gamer. Uh, for other markets, graphics are also equally as important. You can imagine in, inside of an automobile, well, they obviously want to have great lighting and great realism in something like their digital cockpit but they don't have the performance in a Tegra chip to do something like global, real world illumination. So we approximate it using the same technique. We thought uh, a more fun way to, to really showcase uh, what VXGI could do is to uh, recreate something. So this is a, a, a digital recreation of the, the famous moon landing. And in the US, there are some conspiracy theorists <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So this picture. Is that true? <laughs> we will say, you know, there's problems with this with this photo um, um, that prove that, you know, we faked the moon landing. And, then <laughs> uh, and one of the first things we'll say that it's just overall too bright. We can tell based on the scene that the sun is on the other side of, of the lander, um, so he should be in, in complete shadow. And we'll come back to that. Mm. The next thing we'll say is, that, hey, there's no stars. Where are the stars in the scene? There, there ought to be stars if we're, if we're up on the moon. There's no atmosphere, we should be able to see the stars. Uh, and it turns out that's actually just an exposure problem. So if I look back up here at the stars and, and increase the camera exposure, uh, we can see the stars come into view. They're now very pleasantly uh, exposed for. And if I go back to the image, it's a little bright. Um, and it just turns out the, the camera didn't have enough dynamic range to handle 
having mm -hmm. both the stars and the scene that uh, we look at on correct focus. So if I turn down the, the camera exposure, we can see that uh, suddenly the stars fall away, but the rest of our scene comes in to correct exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not oh, sure. Oh, we have a couple more points. We need. <laughs> so, uh, they also point to to this uh, video of of um, Buzz coming down the steps, and they point to this bright spot right here. Yeah. And they say, "Hey, that's that. That's the lighting they left up from that first shot." Oh. And that's how they got enough uh, light to to correctly expose their picture. And they just forgot to take it down when they recorded their video. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's one thing that uh, I was actually hiding. Um, in this demo, and if we go to the angle from which they recorded that video, mm -hmm. and we add Neil Armstrong, who took the picture, into the picture, we can see that his suit is actually the brightest thing up on, on the surface of the, of the moon, because he's standing in direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's actually casting uh, the majority of the light up into the scene, it's bouncing off of his suit, and, and it's actually ah. uh, becoming a flash. Mm -hmm. huh. And again, it's based all on the, on the same technique of, of converting the, the 2D mesh into uh, 3D objects. Um, and then instead of doing ray tracing, which would be computing and bouncing the, the rays of light through the scene, we shoot cones. Um, and it gives us a great approximation without quite the same level of accuracy as what we get with, with full GI. So we, we have a, a, an equal level of contribution into professional graphics as well. We work with um, a variety of different uh, applications and software designers to implement uh, our technologies um, into their applications. So this is RTT Delta Gen. Uh, and Delta Gen, uh, the guys at RTT created a ray tracing engine for it. So this is a combination of, of raster graphics, uh, like what we were just looking at with, uh, with video games, um, as well as ray tracing, so a, a photon simulation. And by combining the two, we get a, a great combination of, of, of good performance, so everything's interactive and, and works great at 4K on a, on a single workstation, plus we get the accuracy of, of the shadows and lighting that we want from, from ray tracing. Uh, and of course, because it's computer graphics, we can do things like change our paint color. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty nice and red as well. Right? Uh, we can put it into completely different scenes, so we can understand how different lighting affects, say, our, our automobile's uh, body design. Uh, and of course, we can also jump into the interior of the car as well, uh, and really understand exactly what the design looks like from, from every single angle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, the, about eight years ago, we, we introduced a technology that we call CUDA. Uh, CUDA allows the GPU to do non-graphics work, to process instructions um, in a highly parallel way, the same way that we produce graphics, but instead support code bases you know, like, like C, C++, Java, Fortran, and uh, a variety of others. Uh, the Titan supercomputer in, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee uses about 19,000 of, of our GPUs. It's currently the second fastest supercomputer in the world fastest in the United States, and of course the U.S. government just recently announced that they were purchasing uh, two more supercomputers from us that'll be the first and, and second fastest in the world. Uh, and it's really hard to showcase the type of work that a supercomputer does, because I don't have 19,000 GPUs sitting in the back room for, from which to process anything. <laughs> uh, but we can give you a, a quick little taste, a little sample uh, of, of what CUDA does. This is um, an astrophysics simulation uh, called Bonsai. Uh, it's a real tool that astrophysicists use to understand what's going to happen uh, to galaxies and other large systems. Uh, and here we have the Milky Way and Andromeda uh, galaxies in about 4 billion years. Uh, we're going to collide. Mm -hmm. So they're using GPUs to uh, compute the gravity of, uh, and velocity of, in this case, 561,750 separate bodies. And we have to compute each and every one of those against each other. Um, in this case, we're getting about 28 frames per second. So very quickly to, to then render out the graphics to provide the result that we see as, as the visual feedback. But of course, if you scale this up to a, 
a supercomputer, the beauty of, of CUDA and an application like this is you get pretty near linear scaling of performance. So this is running on one GPU. Yeah, if you have uh, 18,999 others helping it out, um, you get <laughs> that much more performance and you can add that many more, in this case, solar systems to your simulation. Uh, but this technology is also helping uh, scientists some, solve some of their hardest problems. For the, for the first time, the, the molecular shell of the HIV virus, the capsid, was fully simulated to help pharmaceutical companies uh, come up with better drugs and treatments for it. It was done using GPUs. Mm -hmm. We help surgeons perform surgery uh, on, on the heart. So rather than stop their, their patient's heart, uh, a surgeon can have it digitally stilled by the GPU. So this is the, the live view, and we see in this offset here, um, this grid, the GPU is processing that heartbeat image and removing as much motion as it can in real time. So the surgeon operates, they're presented with this view, they perform surgery on it, and the GPU then has to take all that surgery and remap it back into the 3D space, back onto the patient's heart while it's beating. So the surgery is executed by the robot in perfect synchronization with the heartbeat, because heartbeats can be different and the rhythm can change, it has to be processed in real time. We're also really good at any type of video processing. Um, in this case, it's we're using a, a technique called template matching. So we, we look at every frame, figure out which part of every frame is a face. Then we track those faces individually uh, and compare them against a database of known faces at the bottom. So beyond the, the kind of obvious you know, airport security type applications, um, there's some great home security, but even things like doing a face unlock on a, a cell phone screen and, and having a, a very accurate result um, uh, this applies as, as well as a variety of automotive applications like pedestrian recognition or, or speed limit sign recognition. So this is our, our, our Shield tablet uh, and this uses our, our Tegra K1 SoC. Uh, we, we decided to call it Tegra K1 uh, or TK1 because it uses the same Kepler GPU that we put into desktop uh, PC parts uh, just last generation. And because it's the same architecture, we can do the same type of work, scale down appropriately since we're moving from hundreds of watts down into just a couple of watts. Um, but it means some pretty cool things for, for gamers and, and for uh, uh, consumers as well. I'm just going to plug it here into the TV because it's a little bit easier.